The examination of the interior of the nose is done with a fiber optic instrument called a nasal endoscope, and the procedure is a diagnostic examination of the nose, during which the lighted endoscope is passed into the nose, giving Dr. Setliff important information about many issues, including how much room you have for the passage of air, whether or not the lining suggests an allergy problem, the presence or absence of mechanical obstructions, such as a deviated nasal septum, large turbinates or polyps, the presence or absence of signs of infection, such as swelling, green, yellow or white secretions, and whether or not adenoids, which are tonsil-like tissue, are present in the nasopharynx. Although spraying numbing medication into the nose may be required, it is usually not, as the light functions very much like the headlights of a car, casting a beam much farther than the end of the endoscope, given the very dark interior of the nose. Also, getting the necessary information needed for evaluation and treatment purposes does not take a long time. So, even if it's a bit uncomfortable, the procedure is short-lived. Office nasal endoscopy allows a detailed examination of the nasal and sinus cavities in the outpatient clinics. Nasal endoscopy is currently the preferred initial method of evaluating medical problems, such as nasal stuffiness and obstruction, sinusitis, nasal polyps, nasal tumors, and nosebleeds. Typically, nasal endoscopy is performed with a 30-degree endoscope using the three-pass technique visualizing three main areas in the nasal and sinus cavities. In the first pass, the nasal floor and the nasopharynx are viewed. The endoscope is then brought out and turned upwards and sideways in order to view the drainage areas of the nasal sinuses. In the third pass, the endoscope is used to view the roof of the nose and the area of smell region. Overall, nasal endoscopy is a safe and low-risk procedure Nonetheless, potential minor complications, such as mucosal trauma and bleeding, although rare in Dr. Setliff's hands, may occur, particularly in susceptible patients with increased risk of bleeding, such as those receiving aspirin or other anticoagulant medications. Although numbing sprays are not usually required, they can be administered, usually by request of the patient. If numbing spray is used, adverse reactions to the applied anesthetic medication, also rare, may occur. Thus, before administering these topical medications, patients' allergies will be verified. Dr. Setliff's staff will give you a consent to read through, answer any questions, and then ask you to sign the consent form.